I'm going to start sharing a series. I'm going to minister on this all three nights, tonight, Friday, and Saturday. And I'm going to talk about anger. And specifically, I'm going to share with you, uh, the way I'm going to address this is talk about anger management, which is kind of a buzzword among psychology today. They talk about anger management and stuff. But typically, I don't agree with any of the terminology or any of the things said. But uh, I think that that's a proper way to refer to this. And the first thing that I'm going to be dealing with tonight, in the other previous, in the uh, following messages, I'm going to talk about how to be delivered of an ungodly temper. And uh, we're going to talk about where anger comes from. What is it that makes you angry, which is going to totally surprise and shock many of you. But I promise you, that's the reason very few people are able to manage and control their anger properly is because they they misunderstand, think it's other people that make them angry. We're going to deal with this, and I think it's going to help you. But the very first thing I'm going to talk about tonight is that God is the one that gave you a temper, which may shock some of you. Some of you may be absolutely convinced that a temper is from the devil. And that your anger is from the devil. Well, the way that it's being used and the way that it operates in your life may be demonic. My wife, before we got married, she was a redhead. It's kind of uh, changed colors now. But uh, she had a temper. And praise God, she got delivered of some demonic stuff. And I mean, there were some demonic things in her. This is before we got married, praise God. But uh, it was demonic. And I wouldn't be at all surprised if there aren't people sitting right here in this auditorium tonight that have a temper, that you've done things that have hurt other people, that have hurt you, that have embarrassed you, and that there, I wouldn't be at all surprised if there aren't demonic things in here. And so we are going to talk about that, and we're going to deal with it. But I want you to know this, that Satan never created anything in his life. Satan is not a creator. Satan is a perverter. You know, love. Satan didn't create love. What he does is take it and perverts it and gets into lust and gets into other things. Satan has never come up with an original anything in his life. He takes what God has created and perverts it. And I think that if, like for instance, if we were talking about love, if you were to talk about the right use of love, what God's kind of love is like, and show people the proper use of love, that would go a long ways towards getting people delivered from lust and things like this if you just showed them the proper use. Did you know that the average Christian really doesn't understand that there is a proper use of anger? God gave you the capacity for anger. He made every person in here with a temper. If you don't have a temper... You aren't operating the way that God caused you or created you to be. God gave you a temper. And we're going to be looking at a lot of scriptures tonight that tell you that you are supposed to be angry. And if you aren't using this God-given capacity for anger in the right direction, if you don't understand that there is a proper godly use of anger, then what you're going to do is through ignorance or through... um, You just don't know any better. You are going to wind up channeling this anger towards people and using it in the way that most of us uh, associate anger and you're going to be condemned over it and have a wrong use of it. So in my way of understanding is the very first step to managing your temper is to recognize that the capacity or the ability to have a temper and to get angry is a God-given capacity and you need to recognize the right use of a temper the right use of anger, and that will go a long ways towards you being able to manage and get rid of the wrong use of anger. You need to recognize the proper use of anger. Here in Ephesians chapter 4, in verse 26, we read verse 28 uh, during the offering, the things that I was sharing on that, but in verse 26, Ephesians 4, 26, it says, Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, verse 27, neither give place to the devil. You know, this verse is giving you a command to be angry and sin not. What this is saying is there is a godly type of anger. There is a righteous type of anger. There is an anger that when you're angry isn't sin. There is a right use of anger is what this is saying. 
And you know, this is one of the most perverted, misused scriptures, I believe, in the entire Bible because traditionally, the way that most people understand this scripture is, this is the way that this is taught is often used in marriage seminars. And they'll say things like, God knows you're human. God knows you're going to get angry. And so go ahead and get angry, but it's not sin if you will confess it every night before you go to bed. Don't let the sun set on your wrath. That's the way that this verse is interpreted and applied. That's incorrect. That is not what God's saying. God is not saying it's okay for you to be angry during daylight hours just as long as it's not dark out. He's not saying a little bit of anger is okay. What this is saying is be angry. It's a command and it's not sin if you use it in the right way. He's talking about a righteous anger. Have godly, righteous anger... And then don't let the sun set on it. What he's saying is don't ever let this go dormant. Don't ever fall asleep. Don't ever let your anger subside. But keep yourself stirred up with a godly, righteous type of anger is what this verse is talking about. And then verse 27 says, neither give place to the devil. In other words, he's saying if you don't have a godly type of anger... And if you do let it subside and you become passive, then you are giving place to the devil. Thank you for that thunderous silence. (laughs) See, before I talk about the wrong use of anger, and we will do that tomorrow night, and we'll talk about how to be delivered, you need to recognize that God gave you the capacity to get angry. And actually, anger in your life is one of the great weapons that God has given us for good. As long as you're angry at the right things, as long as you use it in the proper way. If you don't use anger properly, then you are giving place to the devil. You know, I've ministered to a number of people that came to see me about healing of cancer. And this is my experience. I can't show you a verse for this, but I'm just telling you, I've seen thousands of people healed of cancer. We just saw uh, Cleo healed of cancer cancer. She gave her testimony and we've seen lots of people healed of cancer. And in my experience dealing with people that have cancer, cancer is not hard to overcome. It's just persistent. You can't be passive and win a battle against cancer. If you are fearful of cancer, if it's something that bothers you, if you're hurt, if you're heartbroken, if you think about dying, those kind of things, cancer can beat you. But the, but the easiest thing, the thing that I tell most people who come for me to come to me with a problem with cancer, I'll tell them, you know what, if you will stir yourself up and get angry at this thing and say, I refuse to allow this to happen and sit there and fight this like the plague that it is. And if you get angry, anger is one of the greatest things to help you overcome cancer. Passiveness is what kills a lot of people. God gave you the capacity to get angry and just get to a place to where, man, I've taken all of this I'm going to take. I am sick and tired of being sick and tired. And when you get to that place, it is a tremendous spiritual benefit to you. I couldn't tell you the many times, I mean hundreds of times, that I have just tried to put up with something. Say, I can remember one time way back in the beginning of our ministry that Jamie and I were believing for finances and they weren't coming in. And I was trying to be patient and keep confessing the Word and believing God. And yet we were struggling. And it just got to a point where our rent was late. We weren't eating. Our bills weren't paid. We were facing disaster, and I had taken all I could take. I went down to the church building, got to praying, and I just prayed until I got stirred up. And I mean, I got mad at the devil. I was shouting, screaming. If I could have grabbed him, if he would have been physical, I would have done him some damage. I lost my temper. I said, I'm tired of this. This is not the way God made it to be. And man, if I'm going to preach it, I'm going to live it. And I got mad and blasted the devil. And I just knew that I knew that I knew that our problem was solved. And I went home to tell Jamie that, praise God, something happened. Our needs are met. And before I could tell her, she says, a guy had called and was going to meet me at the church and buy our car that we had been advertising for over a month and... and It would solve our problems. And before I could tell her that our problems were solved, she told me. And you know what? And when that happened, I thought, why did I wait a month and let things get to a breaking point before I got violent? 
See, over in Matthew chapter 11, look at this passage of Scripture. It goes right along with the same point that's being made here. But in Matthew chapter 11, this is Jesus speaking. And he's actually talking about John the Baptist. John the Baptist had had some doubt about whether Jesus really was the Christ or not. And so he sent two of his messengers to Jesus. And Jesus, I'm going to break right into the middle of this. In verse uh, 12, Matthew chapter 11, verse 12, it says, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. Some people have struggled with this and wondered, what is this talking about? It just means that we are in warfare. You know what? It's not just a matter of if God loves you, things will work out in your life. God does love you. And God has provided healing for you, prosperity, joy unspeakable and full of glory. God is an absolutely 100% good God. It is not God's will that a single person in here be sick, be poor, be defeated in any area of your life. God never made a piece of junk. God has not destined a single person to failure. God has destined and predestined every one of us to prosper. It is not God's fault that we aren't winning and we aren't seeing greater things happen. But the kingdom of heaven is not only what God wills for us. There is an enemy out there and it's under siege. We are under attack. And because of that, even though it is God's will for you to be well, you don't just automatically get well. We have an enemy that's trying to stop us and you have to learn to fight and overcome. Even though it's God's will for you to prosper, you don't prosper automatically. You have to fight and stand and see those things come to pass. The kingdom of heaven is under siege. We are, we are in a battle and it's only the people that are violently resolved and said, praise God, there aren't enough demons in hell to keep me from getting what God has given to me. Those are the people that are going to receive from God. And the rest of you that are too passive to be like that are going to have to run to somebody else who is violently resolved and get them to do your praying. And that's basically where the body of Christ is. And you know one reason that we are so passive? You know why some of you have put up with sickness for years and years and years? Because you don't use your temper in the proper way. You're mad at people or you're mad at God or you're mad at circumstances instead of understanding that you need to get mad at the devil and the spiritual powers that are holding you back. God gave you a temper and there is spiritual power and ability released when you get to a place that, man, I've had all of this, I'm going to have. And Jesus redeemed me from sickness. He redeemed me from poverty. He redeemed me. It says that if I believe, I rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. And so if I'm not rejoicing, it's not because it's my hormones and it's not because I've eaten too much sugar and I've got a sugar... Man, we've got an excuse now for everything in the world. You know why you aren't rejoicing? If you're depressed, it's because you aren't believing God. And it's because you're angry at people and things instead of angry at the devil and angry at depression. You need to get angry. I hope I make somebody angry tonight. You need to get angry and just reach a place to where, man, I've had all of this I'm about to have. I'm going to get angry in a righteous manner and I am not going to let the sun go down on my wrath. And praise God, I'm not going to live a substandard life. Brothers and sisters, the biggest problem that I face in dealing with people is people who know that it's God's will to heal. They know God can heal. They believe it's God's will. But they're just saying, oh God. Please heal me if it be thy will. Pretty please. You beg, you plead, and then you just sit there and eat bonbons and watch junk on the television waiting on God to heal you. I'm telling you, God has already done His part. God has already placed within you raising from the dead power. And one of the biggest reasons people aren't healed and set free and walking and things is because they accept Defeat. You accept it. You look around and this is the way the world is. And so after all, I'm only human. I'm just a man. It's wrong thinking. I'm not only human. I'm not just a man. One third of me is wall to wall Holy Ghost. And because of that, I'm not going to be sick. It's been 34 years since I've been sick and I'm not going to get sick. I haven't had a he I think I had a headache over the holidays, possibly the first time in my life. I'm not sure because I had never had a headache. 
But I was talking to my son and he said he thought that was a headache. I, I hadn't eaten in 24 hours and I exercised six miles on a treadmill without drinking water. It's just stupid. And I think I had a headache. But that's about it for 34 years and I, I got over it quick. I don't get sick. I'm not going to be sick. And some of you think, I don't believe you can live that way. That's the reason you get headaches. That's the reason you're sick. You know what? I just have decided I'm not going to live that way. And some of you think, you can't, I don't have that authority. Yes, you do. You've got the authority. Your life is going the direction that you have believed for it to be. Now, some of you say, oh, no, I desire for it. Well, there's a difference between desire and believing. And you know what? Part of faith. Matter of fact, Cecil in the morning, if he teaches similar to what he's taught in the past, he's going to talk about dominant faith is the term he uses. I use that there's authority to have faith, true Bible faith. It has to have authority. you got to sit there and take authority over things instead of just passively begging God for something. you got to stand up and demand, not from God because God's already given, but demand that the devil take his hands off of you. And you know what's involved in all of this? Anger. God wants you to be angry. One of the problems is that you're angry at the wrong things and not angry at the devil and angry at poverty and angry at sickness. If you want to get angry, quit being angry at your husband or your wife or your dog or your kids or the person who cuts you off in traffic. Get angry at sickness. Get to where you hate sickness. Man, you hate sickness. You know, many of us were trained not to hate sickness. Many of you were trained that when you're sick, you lay in bed and somebody rubs your fevered brow and gives you sodas to drink and you get to skip school or skip work and it's actually a pretty good deal. (laughs) And uh, you know what? We've gotten to where we embrace sickness. There are people that use sickness to get sympathy and pity and let everybody know how pitiful they are and they use it to get attention. And there are many of you that sickness, you don't hate it. Now, you might hate the sickness that's going to kill you. You don't want to go that far, but a little bit of pain every once in a while. After all, I'm just getting old, and I, you got to put up with some things. And, I, you know, you can't, you can't live to be 80 and still be healthy. Moses was 120 years old, and his eyesight wasn't dim, nor his natural force abated. And what he had is inferior to what he, we have. You know what? We ought to be walking in supernatural health. You ought to be walking in prosperity. But the problem is... We are complacent, passive, and we are allowing the devil to rip us off. Here's another way of saying it. As long as you, as long as you can be sick, you will be sick. As long as you can be poor, you will be poor. As long as you can be depressed, you will be depressed. But you know what? When you reach a place to say, this is it, I draw a line in the sand. And I'm Satan, I'm going to fight you. I refuse to be sick. I'll die fighting sickness. But I will not be sick. Man, if I, even if I never saw it manifest, I'm going to have engraved on my tombstone, I told you I was healed. Amen. <laughs> now I'm healed. But you need to get an attitude that with my last breath, I'm going to refuse to speak poverty, refuse to speak depression, I'm going to fight. We got a lot of wimps, a lot of passive people in the body of Christ that think that a temper is evil. Well, the way that a temper is used a lot of the times is evil. And I'm going to be talking about that the next two nights. And we're going to talk about the wrong use of temper. But there is a godly use of temper. And if you would get stirred up and just say, I am sick and tired of being sick and tired, that would be the difference that would push some of you over into victory. You know that God wants to prosper you, that He came to set you free, and you desire it, but you are just a little wimp. Just begging and pleading and asking and wondering why God hadn't done anything. If you'd stand up and demand your rights, not from God, but from the devil, and say, man, I've had it. I'm refusing to put up with this. And if you'd get angry and put out and be to the place that I cannot tolerate sickness anymore, I will not be sick again, you'd get well. That's what the scripture is talking about, being violently resolved, having a temper. God wants you to be mad. 
Let me show you some other scriptures on this. You know, this isn't what I normally minister on, so I wrote some of this down here so that I could look this up. Psalms chapter 97, verse 10. Let's just look at a few scriptures where the Lord commanded us to be angry. Psalms 97, 10. It says, Ye that love the Lord hate evil. God commanded you to hate evil. God is the one that gave us the capacity for hate. You know, many times in the church when we emphasize love, we talk about turning the other cheek, and I'm going to get into trying to balance all of this tonight. Jesus told about us turning the other cheek and things like that, and I'm going to try and put this into its balance. But in an effort to make the point that we're supposed to love and that we're not supposed to avenge ourselves, many times we present it that Christians are supposed to be so passive that we just don't, nothing ever bothers us, nothing ever ruffles us, and we have actually presented that love is just this sick thing to where there is no anger, there's no, there's nothing, there's no excitement, you are just emotionless. That's not what Jesus was. I'm going to be showing that. We're going to be talking about a lot of things. But here is Scripture, and there's a number of them we're going to read, where God told you to hate. Did you know that we're, we're going to go through all of these Scriptures. I just can't help but give you a preview of these things. because. But I'm trying to say that in the Bible, the Christians in heaven are rejoicing and saying, Yay, God, because you've killed them and the blood has flowed up to the horse's bridle three and four feet high for 120 miles at the Battle of Armageddon. And the Christians are going, Yay, God, and praising God, and they are rejoicing at the destruction of the ungodly. Some people today would say, Oh, I'd never rejoice at the destruction of anybody. God does. The saints in the Bible did. If you have thought that love is never hating anything, you're wrong. You know, I love my wife. And because I love my wife, if you came up tonight and tried to hurt my wife, I'd be mad at you. And I could guarantee you, I'd fight you. I would not just stand there and say, well, I love my wife and I love God and I love everybody and you can kill her if you want to. You can take her money if you want to, but I'm just walking in love. No, part of love is if I truly love my wife, I'm going to hate anybody or anything who tries to do her damage. And a person who says, no, I would never do that, then you don't truly love. If you truly love, it's like a stick. It's got two opposite ends to it. You could title one end of the stick love, and the other end has to be the opposite hate. And it's the same stick. It's, it's all love. If you truly love a person, you have to hate the things that are coming against them. Not hate people, don't misunderstand me, but hate the evil that would come against the person that you love. See, a lack of understanding this has made some Christians to where they are total doves. They would never go to war. They would never fight. They would never harm any person. That is absolutely wrong, and you cannot verify that by Scripture. Jesus talked about turning the other cheek. I'm getting a little off the side. I'm just going to have to say some things and let this go. I can't convince you anyway, but let me just, let me put it this way. If a person comes to me and threatens to kill me because of my stance for the gospel, you know what? I'll turn the other cheek. I've had people spit in my face. I never did a thing to them. I didn't get mad. I wiped it off. Never missed a word in the sentence. I kept right on talking. I've had people threaten to kill me. We had... Two of our Bible college instructors threatened to be killed this last week. We didn't get mad. We didn't retaliate. We prayed for the guy. We did kick him out of school because I don't think it's uh, wise to have a person who's carried guns and tried to kill people stay in our school. That's not being effective. So we did kick him out of school, but we called him in and said, Hey, we love you and we want to help you. And if you will submit to us, we'll even let you back into school. We love this guy. We didn't get mad at him. We didn't call the cops on him. You know what? We love people. So if it's for the gospel that a person persecutes me, I'll turn the other cheek. But you know what? If you come up to me in a dark alley and say, give me your money, I'll say, how bad do you want this money? Are you willing to die for this money? I was trained in Vietnam how to kill a person with my hands. Now, I'm not sure I could do it, 
but I'd tell them I could do it. <laughs> they don't know I can't do it. And I'd say, <laughs> if there's two or three of you, which one of you wants to die first for my 20 bucks? Man, I'll fight you. I'm not going to help that. You know, some people just hand the wallet or it's not worth anything. Well, what you're doing is rewarding this negative behavior. And if every person would fight and resist, you wouldn't find the ungodly quite as quick to do things. Did you know that the states that have laws that you can carry weapons have a lower crime rate because the crooks go to the states where they can't carry weapons because they know there's less resistance? If they knew that it was going to cost them, they wouldn't be as quick to do things. You're helping the problem instead of stopping the problem when you indulge stuff. God gave you a temper to resist evil. And somehow or another we've so perverted it that we think that Christians should never resist anything. Jesus said it this way in John, I believe it's chapter 16 or John chapter 17, when he was before Pilate or Herod. He said they were just amazed that he wouldn't fight back, that he wouldn't do anything. And he says, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom was of this world, then would my servants fight. You know what he was saying? He came to establish a spiritual kingdom. He was dying for the sins of the world, so he turned the other cheek. He let people kill him because it was a spiritual thing, and it was through his death and the shedding of his blood that he was going to bring in salvation. But he said, if my kingdom was a physical kingdom, my servants would fight. And in the book of Revelation, we got a lot of examples of his servants fighting and blood, like I said, flowing for 120 miles, three to four feet high. You have to be able to distinguish if it's a spiritual thing. You can't win a spiritual battle with physical weapons. But you can't win a physical battle with spiritual weapons. And there are scriptural precedent for fighting and waging war. And I tell you, if I would have been President Bush, I'd have, gone, I would, <laughs> I'd have done at least what he did and possibly more. And that's a godly thing to do. And a person who sits there and says, well, I don't think that we ought to even defend ourselves. We ought to just trust God. You have missed one of the lessons that's in the Bible. If it's a spiritual war, fighting the evil, we've got a cultural war going on in our society. You can't fight that with guns and weapons. It's a spiritual battle. And we have to win that in the arena, just like what I'm doing right here, speaking the truth and converting people. But you know what? If it comes to a physical thing, if you try and steal my money from me, I'll punch you in the nose. I'll grab a rock and throw it at you. I'll grab a stick and hit you. And I'll say in the name of Jesus, get out of here and hit you as I'm saying it. There's nothing wrong with that. I can tell some of you are really blessed by this. But see, this is one of the attitudes that I believe is hindering us from winning against the devil. we got people that are so passive, they won't even resist cancer. They, won't, they will ask God and ask Him to take it away, but you don't get mad at it. You'll embrace it. You'll accept it. You allow arthritis. Well, it's just normal. It's a part of getting older. You know what? If you would get angry and say, Man, I just am not having this. This is not my life. I'm not going to live this way. I had a guy who got cancer, and the doctors told him he was going to die. He went to him for a week or two, and then they were going to operate on him, and they were going to start chemotherapy and radiation. And he just says, I'm not going to live this way. That stuff will kill you. So you know what he did? He started jogging six miles a day. He was a couch potato. And when he started, he was only doing 12-minute miles. But he, just, he says, if I'm going to die, I'm going to die in the harness. And he just started running. And as he had run, he'd hate this stuff. And he just got mad and he would get, his adrenaline would flow. And that guy got to where he was running like 10 miles a day. And he, I, I hadn't talked to him in years, but it was about six years past the time the doctors told him he'd be dead. And he just started running and fighting this thing and refusing to put up with it. Never went back, never got their treatment. Linus's wife, I forgot where Linus is, but the uh, director of our Bible school, his wife had cancer and she beat it without a single medical treatment. Don Crow, another teacher in our Bible school, his wife had cancer and she refused any medical treatment. She did alter her diet, but she was healed of it. And in every one of those instances, they got violently resolved and angry and said, I will not live this way. And they overcame it. Cancer is not hard to beat. 
It just needs somebody who's aggressive instead of passive. And if you're saying, God, please heal me, you're going to die unless somebody else who's aggressive prays for you. Man, this is real simple stuff. It's not hard. Look at Proverbs chapter 8. This is a great passage of Scripture. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13. It says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. How many times in the Bible, I'm not going to turn to all of those, but how many times does it talk about fearing the Lord and the benefits of fearing the Lord, reverencing God? Lots of times. And this says, the fear of the Lord. If you want to just substitute, every time it says fear the Lord and all these things, just substitute the words hate evil. That's what the fear of the Lord is. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. And look at this, pride and arrogancy... And the evil way and the forward mouth do I hate. You know, one of the reasons that our society is in the mess that it's in is because in the secular world, the news media, the movies and things like this, did you know that pride is no longer something that is hated, but pride is the norm. Movie stars, uh, athletes, people like this, Muhammad Ali, I am the greatest. Puffing themselves up, presenting pride and arrogancy, it no longer is something that's hated in our culture. It's it's, uh, cultivated, it's promoted, it's accepted. You know why? Because people have quit hating pride and arrogancy, which the Bible says is the fear of the Lord, the beginning of wisdom. You are supposed to hate pride, which I could spend a whole message on that, but pride is just self-centeredness. You are supposed to hate self-seeking, and yet we pay big bucks to go see people that are egomaniacs. You know, I don't know a lot about entertainment, guys. When we play these games where you come to the entertainment category, I just sit out. Because I don't, I haven't participated in that a lot. But I did read on the internet this last week about Britney Spears going and getting married to a high school beau, and within 24 hours or something, she disannulled it. She's a spoiled brat. I'm not against Britney Spears, but she is a spoiled brat, a prima donna, gets married and annuls it in 24 hours, and people worship the ground that she walks on, think that she's awesome. You know what? Movie stars as a whole, again, there's always going to be an exception, but as a whole, movie stars are jerks. They are the scum of society. They are. They've been married a dozen times. They are immoral. They are ungodly. They are the scum of society, and yet we have magazines with their picture on the front paper. We glorify them because people have quit hating pride and arrogancy evil ways. And that's the reason. It's the reason this has happened is because the church has been lulled to sleep into passiveness. And because of it, we're losing a cultural war in our society because the church doesn't hate anything. We don't want to offend anybody. I don't want anybody to be upset. I'm not against people. I love Britney Spears. If she was here tonight, I'd witness to her and tell her that God loves her and share the gospel with her. I'm not against her, but I'm saying she is acting like a fool. And it shouldn't be encouraged and she shouldn't be revered and looked at. It's just stupid. And I know that there's many of you here who enjoy all of these things and I may be upsetting you, but I hope I make you mad. Amen. You need to get mad about something. (laughs) Praise God. It says pride, arrogancy, the evil way, and the froward mouth. You know what the word froward means? It means perverse. I wrote down, let's see, a definition of perverse. Dictionary definition. It means directed away from what is right or good. Perverted. Do you hate everything that is directed away from speaking good? I bet you some of you that said yes, 
watch sitcoms and movies that are perverse. They are directed away from what is good and yet you don't hate it. You use it for entertainment. I'm not trying to condemn you. God loves you. I'm just saying, you know what? We don't hate evil. You're supposed to hate evil. The second definition of perverse is obstinately persisting in an error or fault. Man, you could take nearly every newspaper, news broadcast and everything, and they are obstinately persisting in a fault. You ought to hate perverse, forward things when you know somebody is just speaking lies. Man, our news outlets today, they are lying. We had a friend, I forget exactly who this is, but somebody is in Iraq, a friend of a friend is in Iraq, and they wrote back, and the the thing that they told uh, this friend of mine was, says, don't believe a thing you hear on the uh, television. says, there are a few Iraqis, of course, that don't like, and they're trying to kill, and they kill Americans and stuff, but says, man, the Iraqis are dancing in the streets, They are thanking us over and over and over for being there. The Iraqis are thrilled to be out from under the reign of Saddam Hussein. And our perverse, forward news media is persisting and obstinately denying the truth and reporting lies. And many of us watch it. Because we don't hate evil. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, if you are going to see the victory of God manifest in your life, you've got to lose your temper, not against people. I'm going to try and put all this into its perspective tomorrow night. But you need to lose your anger against the lies, the deception, the things that Satan is doing and just reach a place where, praise God, I am not going to live this way. An anger is a godly force if it's directed in the right way. The problem has been that we haven't directed it. We haven't managed it. That's the reason I'm saying I'm calling this series Anger Management because we need to manage it and point it in the right direction. Look at Psalms 110. Excuse me, Psalms 111, verse 10. I need to go through some of these scriptures quickly because I'm trying to establish that an anger is not an ungodly thing. It's just depending on how you use it. Psalms 111, verse 10, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And we found out in that last verse that the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. So therefore, hating evil is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do His commandments. His praise endureth forever. If you would use anger in the right way and direct it against evil... You know what? You would start understanding some things. Instead of confusion, there would be positiveness. One of the things that's happened to our society today is that there are no absolutes and therefore you can't be absolutely opposed to anything. It's got to all be conditional on the circumstances. You know what? With the gospel, there are absolutes. God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. And I am absolutely sure that homosexuality is a sin. Now, does this mean that I hate homosexuals? No. I've got friends. Friends, not acquaintances, not somebody I know. I have friends. People who are good friends of mine who have struggled with homosexuality and deal with it, and I have never rebuked them. I've been merciful to them. I'm kind to them. I do not hate homosexuality, I mean homosexuals, but I hate homosexuality. And I've told them so, and I've told them that this is absolutely wrong. And there are no exceptions to it. But you know what? The church is afraid today to say the truth because, you know, we're afraid of being politically incorrect and somebody might misunderstand. Jamie was watching an interview with George Bush on the television. And who was it? Diane Sawyer, I think, was interviewing him. And she tried to entrap him. And she says, So, Mr. President, do you think homosexuals are sinners? She tried to draw him into a thing where he would condemn homosexuals and thereby, uh, you know, be vulnerable to criticism. And man, it was really sharp. God gave him wisdom. He says, Diane, he says, we're all sinners. 
He says, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And he says, one of my favorite scriptures is, don't cast the speck out of somebody else's eye as long as you got a beam in your own. And he says, I'm not here to condemn anybody, but I do believe that marriage is between a male and a female. And then he stated his stance. And that was, it was really wisdom the way that he did it. And that's what I'm trying to say. I'm not against homosexuals, but I hate homosexuality because if you just looked at it even without the Lord, did you know that the percentage, uh, are the uh, rates of suicide are the highest among homosexuals of any group of people in the nation? It's like two and three and four times as much. It's killing people. The depression rate is higher. The disease rate is higher and everything else. Homosexuality is bad news. It's wrong. I love homosexuals. If there's a homosexual here tonight, we love you and we want to help you and we'll pray with you and do what we can. But I'm telling you, homosexuality is wrong. It's the devil. And you're deceived. And that's the truth. And that's in love. I'm preaching better than you're listening. There's a lot of you that think, I don't like you to say things like this. Well, see, that's because you've accepted this lie that just passiveness and never having an opinion about anything and just letting somebody run smooth over you is godly. You know, let me show you some scriptures about Jesus. Look over in John chapter 2. John chapter 2. Verse 14. Actually, start reading with verse 13. It says, And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money, and overthrew the tables, and said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house an house of merchandise. And in verse 17, And his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Do you think Jesus was in sin when he did this? Certainly not. Jesus was without sin. Do you think that Jesus went in and passively, you know, with this wimpy feminine, effeminate looking thing where he's got his fingers up like this, you know, with a whip and he says, guys, I hate to do this. I don't want you to misunderstand, but I've got to drive you out of here. Please understand. And he just gently turned the table over and says, shoo, please get out of here. I guarantee you, Jesus was angry. He made a whip. He beat people with a whip, overturned their money drove them out. And you know what? This was against Jewish law. And there were Roman soldiers there to enforce things. And Jesus had so much rage. There was, I mean, have you ever been around somebody that it's just like they've lost it? And because of it, nobody will do anything because they are out of control. There is no telling what they're going to do. Jesus lost it in a good way. And Roman soldiers were standing there, Jewish guards that were there to enforce the scribes and the Pharisees, and nobody touched him. Nobody did anything because Jesus would have beat the beat them to a pulp. He had a whip. He went in with a weapon and drove people out of the money out of the temple. And you won't see this if you don't understand the chronological order of Scripture, but this was the very first time he was in Jerusalem after his uh, baptism in water. He did this again in Mark chapter 11 at the end of his ministry two years later. He didn't do this one time. He drove the money changers out, overturned all of their stuff, and then in Mark chapter 11, right before his crucifixion, he came back and because they had reinstituted all of this stuff, he did it again. It wasn't a mistake. It wasn't just something that God let him buy with one time. It was deliberate. It was planned. And when the people reinstated this money change and stuff in the temple, he did it a second time. This is Jesus, the sinless Son of God, the same one who when he was standing in front of the people accomplishing God's will, allowed them to smite him, spit in his face. He refused to fight back. Those, that's the same person. And they're both consistent. He was doing a spiritual battle 
He was accomplishing God's will by submitting and letting them smite him. But you know what? When it came to something physical, natural, and just out and out sin, he expressed his anger against it, and that is a godly attitude. Thank you for that thunderous silence. There wasn't a single amen to that. And yet today, if somebody would do that, you know what? We would say, how unchristlike!" And yet Jesus did it. Brothers and sisters, there's a right use of anger. It's just not supposed to be a people. It's at the devil. Some people say, well, it looked like Jesus was angry at those people. No, he was angry at the devil. You know, I heard... Um, I forgot who this was right now. Oh, it was um, Smith Wigglesworth. When he would pray for people, he used to hit people, punch them. One time he grabbed a baby and kicked the baby off the platform. About a you know six-month-old baby that he was praying for. Kicked it into the front row. And it was healed when it landed. He used to hit people and yell and scream. And people criticized him and says, What's wrong with you? Why do you do these things? And he says, I'm... He, they criticized him and said, you're mad at people. You hit people. And he says, I'm not mad at people. He says, I'm after the devil. I can't help it if their body gets in the way. <laughs> he saw tumors as demons. He hated them and he would hit them and grab them and do things. And he says, I can't help it if their body gets in the way. I believe that's what Jesus was doing. He saw the demons that were doing this travesty in his father's house. And he was getting rid of those demons and he couldn't help it if it was in a person. That's like in one of my services. I had a woman one time that Jamie was singing hallelujah just like she did tonight. He was real soft and worshipful. And this Pentecostal lady just started going hallelujah like that. And she'd scream and yell. It scared everybody half to death the first time she did it. I sent some of my guys back and asked her if she'd quiet down. And they came back and said, she says it's God. She can't control it. So I went back to talk to her and she was back there just going Hallelujah like that. And I said, lady, this isn't God. And she says, oh, it is God. I feel God all over me. I showed her in 1 Corinthians 14, the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. I said, you can praise God, but do it in a way that's worshipful. This is inconsistent with what we're doing right now. And she says, oh, it's the Holy Spirit. And I said, nope, the Holy Spirit won't control you. You can control it, what that verse is saying. Spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. She says, no, it's God. And I said, it's the devil. And I said, I'm going to stop this. And she says, oh, I can't stop it. And I said, look, this devil is leaving this auditorium. If you would allow it, I'll cast it out and it can leave and you can stay. But if you are going to cooperate with this, you're going to leave with that devil. And she says, I can't help it. And she says, hallelujah. So we had a couple of guys help me. We picked her up and set her outside and said, don't come back. And you know what? I saw that woman years later and she thanked me and she says, you know, that was a religious spirit and I've been delivered and I'm free. And she said, thank you for telling me the truth. See, I wasn't mad at her. I was just getting rid of that. De that devil was not going to interrupt my service. And if she would uh, cooperate, we could send the devil out. If she doesn't cooperate, we'll send her out with the devil. <laughs> Amen. So Jesus was just getting the devils out of the temple. He couldn't help it if people were allowing the devils to stay in them. Jesus got angry. That's a godly trait. Be angry and sin not. Don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. You know, in the book of Galatians, if you ever study that, Paul got so mad. He was angry because the people had come out of grace and had gone back into legalism. And he was brutal. He was brutal with them. He said terrible things. He says, if anybody's preaching another gospel unto you than that which I have not preached, let him be accursed. I'm sure people just, oh, I can't believe he said that. And so they probably thought he must not mean what he said. So he says in the next verse, again, I say unto you, that if anybody preaches any other gospel than that which I've preached, let him be accursed. He was vicious. He said in Galatians 4, 16, Have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? He was tough with them. And then in Galatians chapter 5, verse 12, after he had talked about these Jews that were arguing over circumcision, and he says, they're doing this so that they can glory in your flesh. Paul said, I would, they were cut off who trouble you. 
And excuse me for being plain, but Paul's the one that said this. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about these Jews who are wanting to circumcise all of the male Christians. He says, I wish they were all castrated. He says, man, if they want a glory in your flesh, just castrate them. That's exact. You look it up in any translation, that's what he's talking about. You know what? Paul was ticked off at the Judaizers. And yet we're afraid that we're going to say something that's going to offend somebody, so we call them vertically challenged instead of short. I tell you what, every time you cooperate with that, you are just deadening yourself to a godly type of anger. You're making yourself a target for the devil. You're giving place to the devil because you don't have a backbone and you don't have a spine. Brothers and sisters, God made us to stand up and to fight the devil. I'm not talking about fighting people. I am not against people. If somebody here is mad tonight, Chuck was with me in Fort Worth when a woman just railed on me and told me I was scum. And you know what? Instead of getting in and justifying myself and how dare you say that, she was expecting me to justify myself and fight with her and I just apologized and I said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm not what you want me to be. And I didn't try and justify myself and I just said, I'm sorry. And I let her rail on me. I've let, I do not fight people. I am not angry at people. But you know what? I am angry at the devil. And I am angry at sickness. And I am angry at what Satan is doing. And I do say things. And I do have a temper. I just am not mad at people. My wife can tell you she's never seen me lose my temper. She's never seen me get mad. My kids told me that one of the things that they disliked about me was that I wasn't like other parents because I never got mad. I never yelled at them. I've never raised my voice. I am not talking about being angry at people. I am a very mellow guy. I'm a nice guy. But you know what? I hate the devil. And I hate sickness. And I hate poverty. And I hate depression. And I hate evil and perverse things and pride and arrogancy. And I don't tolerate them. And I've got a temper. I just choose where I direct it. There is a right use of a temper. You know, just for time's sake tonight, I'm not going to turn over here and read this, but let me give you some scriptures. If you're writing things down, you can look these up. Romans chapter 12, verse 19 says, Let your love be without dissimulation. That means, the word dissimulation means hypocrisy. Don't let your love be hypocritical. And then the rest of the verse goes on to say, Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. If you don't hate evil, then you, your love is hypocritical. If you say you love God, but you don't hate the things that oppose God, you don't have true God kind of love. That usually goes over about like that. <laughs> Revelation chapter 6, verses 16. Let me just read these out to you. Revelation 6, 16 through 17. Revelation 11, 18. Revelation 12, 12. Revelation 14, 10 and verse 19. Revelation 15, 1 and 7. Revelation 16, 1 and 19. Every one of these verses are talking about the wrath of God being poured out. The vials, woe unto the inhabitants of the world, for the wrath of God is coming. People are crying out and asking the rocks to destroy them because the wrath of God is released. In Revelation 19, 1 through 6, and Revelation 16, verse 5, the saints and angels rejoice and say, God, you are worthy. What great wisdom because they've slain the blood of the saints and you have given them blood to drink, their own blood. Worthy are you. And they start worshiping and praising and rejoicing to see the destruction of the wicked. You know what? There's some people right here in this auditorium tonight that you can't even rejoice to see a wicked person lose. That's not a proper attitude of love. Again, you could feel pity towards the person and say it's a shame. But you know what? I am glad to see that righteousness prevails and that evil fails. Amen. I am glad to see that there is a reward for the wicked. And I am for righteousness and I oppose wickedness. And you know what? That's a godly attitude. I go back to the scripture we started with, Ephesians 4.26. Be angry 
and sin not. Don't let the sun go down. Don't ever let it fall asleep. Stir yourself up. You've got to do things to make yourself stirred up because this whole world has become passive. The whole world has embraced ungodliness. They don't hate pride and arrogance, the evil way, a froward mouth. They've embraced it. They support it. Christians are giving ratings to movies that are totally perverse. If it wasn't for the Christians, you know, if we would vote with our television and our movie going and things like this, you could totally change this society if Christians truly hated evil and refused to give in to things like that. We are the largest block. I'm talking about spirit-filled, tongue-talking Christians are the largest voting block in this nation. And if we truly acted consistent with God and voted with our pocketbook, you know what? You could change the movie industry. You could change television. You could change everything. But Christians don't really hate this stuff. And we help foster it by our, by our passive attitude towards things. Again, I'm not saying that you have to be a, a political activist. You know, I don't like abortion. I hate abortion. But I just am not into standing in front of abortion clinics and picketing them and doing things. Now, I, some of you may do that. I'm not against you. I'm saying, I guess we should use every available thing. But, you know, I got convicted many years ago that we needed to do something about abortion. I didn't want to go stand in front of a clinic. So, you know what I did? We started a pregnancy center in Colorado Springs, and I used my radio and other things to promote it. I rented a spot in the most popular mall, and I spent tens of thousands of dollars printing up things. And we took a little pregnancy center that in one year's time it had 10 clients, and we now have over 400 and something clients per month. We had a front page ad in the Gazette Telegraph in Colorado Springs that the abortion rate in Colorado had been cut in half and the state abortion rate had been cut in one-third because of that pregnancy center. So I'm not saying you have to pick it. I've never picketed it, but you know what? I hate abortion and I have done something about it to help do something and we invest it. We spend money on it every month and give to the Colorado Springs Pregnancy Center and I'm doing something about it and I hate abortion. I don't just talk about it. I do something. So I'm not saying you have to go get in somebody's face and yell at them. You can operate in love towards the person, but we need to get to where we hate evil and where we hate ungodliness and where we hate sickness and disease and poverty and tragedy and depression. And I'm just refusing to live this way. I pray that I've conveyed what I've trying to get across to you here tonight, but I'm saying, brothers and sisters, there are many of you that the reason you are still sick, poor, depressed, and defeated is because you can live that way. When you reach a place where I can't live this way anymore, I won't live this way anymore. I'm going to do something, even if it's wrong. But I am not going to stay here. It's like those lepers that were sitting at the gate of Samaria and they said how long are we going to sit here till we die if we stay here we're going to die if we go into the city the famine's going to get us let's go out to the Syrians and if they kill us we're just going to die anyway we're going to die anyway we might as well take the uh, one option we've got left in other words get up and do something there are some people in this auditorium that you're dying whether it's physically or emotionally financially Satan is beating you to a pulp and you wish things would change, but you haven't got a fight left on the inside of you. You are sitting there passively begging and pleading with God. I'm telling you, stir yourself up and get angry and just refuse to let the devil steal from you anymore. That is part of the battle. Matter of fact, I have found out that when you get that attitude, the devil is at heart a coward. And you know what? He, he won't fight you if he knows he's going to lose. The reason he's fighting you so hard is because you are passive and you're giving in and he can win. You know, I used to be a jogger. I still jog some, but I, I'm a walker more than anything else now. And anyway, I used to jog. I've, been, I've had dogs chase me. 
all over the United States. I was treed in Sylacauga, Alabama one time at four in the morning by five dogs for an hour and something until somebody got up and called the dogs off. I've been bitten by dogs, treed by dogs, chased by dogs. And I'm, I don't have a fear of dogs, but I've just had so many bad experiences that, you know what, it was just a pain. And one day I was in Trinidad, Colorado. I went home with these people. I was staying in their home, and they let me stay in their bedroom. And they had a pit bulldog. And this pit bulldog was an attack dog. And it must have had 15 first-place trophies for being an attack dog in this room. It had uh, certificates, ribbons, trophies. And when we got ready to go to bed, they said, you'll be staying in this room. And it was the pit bulldog's room. And I was okay as long as the owners were there, you know. But I said, now, hey, what happens if I have to get up and go to the bathroom during the night? I said, what's going to happen with this bulldog? They said, it wouldn't hurt you. And I said, but what about all these attack trophies and stuff? They said, it's an attack dog. It's not a mean dog. And I thought to myself, what's the difference? (laughs) And they said... A mean dog would bite you. said an attack dog is trained. It would never hurt anybody. And they gave this example of a robber that broke into their home. They weren't there. And for four hours, this attack dog knocked that robber, barked at it and chased it. It fell down and he grabbed the guy's arm. And for four hours, he held that man's arm. And every time he'd start to get up and move, he'd growl and squeeze. But he never did break the skin and he never hurt him. He says, that's an attack dog. He says, a dog that would bite somebody like a jogger. I told him about some of my experiences. He says, that's a mean dog. And he says, I would kill a dog like that. And when he said that, it's just like something dawned on me that, you know what? I'm the one that God said, the fear of me and the dread of me would be on every beast of the field. And it just dawned on me. I've been letting dogs intimidate me. And I said, I'm the one with the authority. I said, how dare these dogs? And I've, I've had dogs most of my life. I don't have one right now, but I'm not against dogs. I'm a dog lover. I like dogs. I still, if a dog had like had puppies, I wouldn't invade their, their turf, you know, and do something that would be considered threatening. I would never do anything to hurt a dog. But if I'm jogging down the street, and a dog comes out against me, it had best be able to defend itself. And you know what? My attitude changed. And not long after that, I was jogging down the street, and two Dobermans came out after me. And Dobermans were the ones that seemed to bother me the most. And these Dobermans were chasing me. And I tell you what, I lost it. I got mad at those dogs. How dare you come out against me? This is public property. I'm jogging down a public street. You got no right to do this. And I grabbed a stick and I started swinging. And if I could have grabbed one of those dogs, it would have been in bad, bad shape. And you know what? It was funny to see two Dobermans running down the street with a jogger chasing them. (laughs) And that has been probably 20 years ago. And did you know, here's my point. When I change my attitude, animals somehow or another know that. And since I've changed my attitude, I have never had a dog bite me, tree me. I've had a few come out at me, but as soon as they see my attitude, they are gone. I have never, ever, ever had another bad experience with a dog ever. And part of the reason I had that was because they could sense my weakness and they took advantage of it. And Satan is just like a dog. Satan knows whether you are... I mean, you are going to fight to the death and whether you have an attitude or if you are passive and just going through the motions. And if he can perceive weakness in you, Satan will go about and devour you. He goes about seeking whom he may devour. You know, the people he can devour are weak, passive people that have been lulled to sleep to thinking that I don't ever get angry and I have to take this sickness and disease and poverty patiently and glorify God in it. No, you need to get to where you hate that stuff. And when you get that attitude, Satan will tuck his tail and run. And I tell you, one of the best things you could ever do is learn how to get angry in a righteous way and never let the sun go down on your wrath. You need to stir yourself up.
That's what I'm here for tonight, is to stir you up, to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comforted. (laughs) Amen. You need to be stirred up. Hallelujah. Praise God. Father, we love you for your word. Thank you for these truths out of your word.